Hey guys, it's Brandon with Low T Nation, and uh, today I want to put a quick video together to kind of discuss the benefits of our growth hormone um, secretagogues or peptides, and um, tell you guys like what they're for and the differences in the the options that we actually have. We get a ton of questions on this, so I just want to kind of preemptively strike with a, uh, a video regarding these two. So, growth hormone in the body is a phenomenally strong, incredibly beneficial hormone big time um, what it does for building muscle it, it is the strongest anabolic hormone in the body it builds muscle like nothing else um, it builds strong bones like nothing else in the body big time it, it's one of the strongest lipase hormones which means it um, increases lipolysis or weight loss fat burn if you will also um, so along those lines it is fantastic physically um, what it doesn't do is anything for you between the ears um, I like to say between the ears no focus benefit no concentration no energy increase at all nothing in the bedroom you know so if those are the issue um, growth hormone doesn't do anything for you, you know, that those are more testosterone related but if you're looking to build muscle and burn fat while also keeping your bones and organs as healthy as possible this is the way to go okay now when you inject straight growth hormone it comes in in a massive spike, right? A huge spike. It turns it into IGF-1, which we'll get into later. That massive influx of IGF-1 causes flat bone growth. It causes organ distension. Like if you look at bodybuilders these days versus 20 years ago, there's an obvious difference, right? These guys, their hands are big, their heads are growing, and they're in their 30s. Um, they have those huge distended guts because their organs have grown so much that's from having way too much growth hormone right so we can prescribe it you know um, there are some patients who have you know like very late stage HIV they have sarcopenia muscle wasting disorders in that event right the risk reward is there but it's super rare so if you're not if you don't come if you come to us uh, as just a normal guy we absolutely will not write straight growth hormone prescriptions anymore at all we just use one of these peptides the peptides are probably 60 to 70 percent as effective they reduce the um, side effects tremendously okay um, and they're pennies on the dollar as compared to actual growth hormone okay and another thing when you inject growth hormone not only does IGF-1 go crazy prolactin goes crazy cortisol goes crazy um, your blood sugar therefore insulin goes crazy a lot of uh, bodybuilders these days and guys that just abuse growth hormone they put themselves on the type 2 spectrum they're, they're now diabetics um, because of the blood sugar rush okay ipamorelin and ibutamorin those are the primary ones that we use again I'll get into it hardly any cortisol actually no cortisol uh, production from those two limited prolactin and limited sugar increase right very limited sugar increase as well um, so the side effects are incredibly negligible all right so let's get into real quick just a little bit on how growth hormone is actually produced in the body because this is going to highlight the differences between our two primary medications so the hypothalamus we always we tend to always start there um, it signals the pituitary to make growth hormone that's made in the pituitary this signal is called growth hormone releasing hormone okay GHRH that is the signal that when the hypothalamus sees low levels um, of growth hormones, actually IGF-1, um, it says, hey, we need a little more, you know, or and there's, some other, there's some other things that can signal this as well. So let's, get, let's talk about those. Um, heavy exercise is one signal for growth hormone production. Um, an increase in protein intake or amino acid intake does it. There are certain stressors that um, both good and bad um, that increase uh, this as well um, low blood sugar so um, hypoglycemia just that and also um, low lipid levels okay so when you when your triglycerides get very very low that can actually um, signal growth hormone production because it can kind of do something to fix all of these right so um, those are and there's some there's some sleep um, stages that actually increase this as well um, these are things that increase growth hormone releasing hormone all right and there's another 
signal that creates it, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so the pituitary, it goes out and releases growth hormone, right? And so there's these molecules go out in the body. There are receptors in muscle. There's receptors in your organs. There's receptors um, in bone that pick this stuff up, and it, they, it goes to work, right? Repairing bone. Uh, it helps with bone remodeling like crazy. There's these osteoblasts and osteoclasts that use this growth hormone. They increase bone remineral remineralization tremendously. What it does for protein uptake in muscle or amino acid uptake and protein production in muscle is tremendous. It, it increases glycogen um, uptake in the muscles. It just is so, there's so many benefits to this, all right? Um, another thing that happens to this is it goes to the liver and the liver produces something called IGF-1, which we've been talking about. And it's insulin like growth factor type one. And so IGF-1 is actually stronger than the original growth hormone. It does the same thing. It goes to organs, it goes to bone, it goes to your brain. It does a lot of things that help increase um, you know, recovery or muscle growth or bone remineralization. Uh, but what it also does is, like I was saying, in, in the bodybuilder um, application where you're getting too much, this is too strong of a hormone to have at, at very high levels in the body, right? So the body protects itself. Your body's amazing at knowing when to shut off production of certain hormones, right, back down to, to healthy levels. So this has a negative effect on the, the production of, of growth hormone because it goes to the hypothalamus and it signals the production of something called somatostatin, right? And somatostatin shuts down production of this, right? So when your body sees increased IGF-1 levels, um, it goes to the hypothalamus, it slows down growth hormone, releasing hormone production, increases somatostatin production, and that kind of shuts the door um, until later one of those activating um, processes fires it back up and opens the door again, all right? And by the way, this is incredibly simplified. This is, this is an elementary explanation of this process. It is, there are a lot more moving pieces. It's a very complex process, but just for the sake of this video, we'll keep it right there, all right? Now, I almost forgot something. There's another stimuli. So this is a very poorly drawn stomach. But in the stomach, there are these cells called X cells. They produce a hunger hormone called ghrelin, and it's G-H-R-E. L-I-N, ghrelin. And the way to remember that, if your stomach is growling, it's because of ghrelin. It's, I've heard somebody say that before. Um, it does the same thing, right? It increases um, production of, of growth hormone, but same thing. It gets down to IGF-1. IGF-1 gets in the bloodstream, makes it back up, um, shuts down production. Okay, so two, these are two primary precursors to growth hormone production, and these actually represent our two primary uh, mechanisms or peptides. So one of our peptides is called ipamorelin, and it's compounded with something called CJC1295, and then the other one is ibutamorin, or it's also known as MK677. And you may have, you, that gets listed as a SARM a lot of times. SARM is a selective androgen receptor modulator. Um, being a androgen receptor modulator, it has to be an androgen, right? If you're an androgen receptor, the only thing that you're going to jive with um, and, you know, allow to, to bind is an androgen, right? This is definitely not an androgen, okay? So um, it gets sold, like, over the counter sometimes as a SARM. <clears throat> so just keep that in mind. Technically, Ibutamorin is, is a non-peptide, but for just for the sake of this video, we're just going to call it a peptide. Um, its molecular class is just a little bit off. So the way these work, ipamorelin and CJC1295 work together. The CJC1295 is a growth hormone releasing hormone mimic, right? So the, the pituitary sees it. It goes, okay, I know what to do. You're a growth hormone releasing hormone. I'm going to make growth hormone. And ipamorelin, what it does is it shuts down the production of the stomatis, somatis, stomatostatin. Man, tongue tied here. Somatostatin. And so what this does, it opens the door, right? It's creating growth hormone, 
the growth hormone is being produced, IGF-1 is being produced at safe, natural levels, not the injected, like crazy spike. And also the ipamorelin is holding the door open. It's keeping the process alive, right? It's not letting it shut down. Ipamorelin lasts about four hours, so you get a good solid four hour uh, boost. And again, at natural levels. So when you look at this on a chart, like IGF-1 levels do this when you inject growth hormone. It's this when you um, are using one of these peptides. And also like there's a line somewhat above that that is where all the side effects happen, right? So we're staying under that line, cortisol production, prolactin production, sugar increases, you know, gross IGF-1 production. Those are all above that line. We're staying under that line with a nice, steady, slow, intelligent pulse of growth hormone. Um, that's how that works. Ibutamorin is a ghrelin mimic, right? But the problem with that um, is ghrelin is a hunger hormone, okay? Now, for some people, that's not a problem. If you're the guy trying to eat four or 5,000 calories a day to put on a lot of mass, this is a godsend for you, right? It will make you eat yourself out of house and home. It affects different people differently, right? And one way to get around this is if you take it at night, um, it really diminishes the hunger throughout the next day, right? And the beauty of both of these, now I'm gonna start talking about some of the, the, the contrasting um, differences. So sleep benefit. Both of these are fantastic on increasing sleep, big time, okay? Um, in fact, we don't write it for this, of course, but a lot of people have come to us and they say, I don't take any more sleep medication. I don't have to take you know, anything to help me fall asleep at all. They just sleep fantastic. I personally sleep about an hour less at, when I, at night when I'm taking these because my sleep quality, I'm not a big sleeper anyway, but my sleep quality is so much better. And I would track it with a whoop. Um, it's, it's markedly and, and visibly, measurably better, okay? Um, another issue with, so I'll go back to the hunger problem. Um, I'm personally, like, I've never had any discipline issues with food. I'm just blessed. I, you know, food's never been a, like, just eating and eating and eating has never been a big motivator for me. <clears throat> I haven't had to worry about that. When I take ibutamorin, I am famished all day long. And it doesn't matter how much I eat. I cannot satiate myself at all. So keep that in mind. If you're trying to lose weight, this is probably a better option. If you're trying to gain weight, gain muscle, um, this is a fantastic option for you. So um, oral versus injections. The ipamorelin is a daily injection, right? Some people don't want to deal with that. The beauty of ibutamorin, it is an oral, you know? So um, that is a big deciding factor for a lot of people, right? All of the other benefits are going to be the same, right? The only other additional um, problem that people run into is water retention. And there's no water retention with the ipamorelin. There can be some fairly significant water retention with people using ibutamorin. But again, there's just no way to tell if that's gonna be you until you try it, okay? So the way these work at our clinic, if you're on our testosterone plan, um, they're $200 additional a month. When you compare that to what actual growth hormone costs, it is pennies on the dollar. And again, this is 60 to 70%, and I'm kinda of making that number up, but um, anecdotally, it seems like they're 60 to 70% as effective with none of the side effects for pennies on the dollar, right? a no-brainer. That's why we don't even write the growth hormone prescriptions anymore unless there's a, an outstanding circumstance. But um, if you're not on our testosterone program, uh, they're $300 a month. All of our peptides are $300 a month, and we discount them if you're already paying us for the testosterone program. So if you guys have any questions on this, please, um, you know, don't hesitate. I'm super happy to answer any questions. Um, if you guys want to try them out, just let us know. We're happy to, to facilitate that. I uh, hope you guys have a great day. Thanks for watching. Have a good day.